You've heard me say it countless times on this podcast. The people around you are committing murders. You aren't, hopefully, but that doesn't mean the guy waving at you while raking his leaves as you jog by on your neighborhood run is innocent. The nice lady in line at the bank that strikes up a conversation about how pretty the weather is today may be hiding literal skeletons in her closet. The simple fact is, there are people in this world that act without remorse, without inhibition. The compulsion to kill, plus a sinister plan to carry it out, is what we are talking about today. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and thank you for joining today. The episode you're about to listen to is one of those occasional much longer than 10 minutes. Some stories are so strange and so compelling that they need more time to explain. If this is the first time that you're stopping by to listen to the podcast, you may be a little bit confused after listening to the name of the show versus the duration of this episode. Normally, they're much shorter. I try to condense the stories of true crime into a time frame of around 10 minutes. Sometimes I go over by a little bit, but every now and then, like today, I go over by a lot of it. If you want to keep listening to 10 Minute Murder past this episode, subscribe wherever you're listening right now, and you can easily find the show whenever you want. And listening to back episodes are also much easier when you're subscribed to 10 Minute Murder. And connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. You see the visuals that go along with the stories that you're hearing about. It's nothing gross and nothing graphic, but I'm always curious when I'm personally listening to a podcast, what the people and the places look like. So I look that up and I do that for this show as well. So I post that on social media. And if I do post crime scene photos, it will not be gruesome dead bodies. I personally don't want to see that. And I assume that you're the same. I know what your next question is going to be. Where can we find 10-minute murder shirts and stickers? Thank you for asking. That's very sweet of you. In the show notes of this episode, there's a link to the merch store. Everything you're looking for is going to be there. Okay, now to the story. They say middle children are often excluded. They weren't raised as carefully as the eldest, and they aren't cared for quite like the baby. In the situation of Israel Keyes, he had an extreme case of middle child syndrome. In fact, not only is he a middle child, but he was one of 10 children born to his parents, John and Heidi. Born in Utah, January 7, 1978, he was raised in an outlandish family that seemed to have been outcasts of society. His parents didn't believe in the typical way of living. They didn't believe in public schools or modern medications, and they kept their family away from anyone that did. They especially didn't welcome any form of government interference. When Israel was only a toddler, his parents packed up and moved him and his siblings from Utah to Washington. Here they lived secluded in an area deep inside the forested woods, where Israel grew up without heat, without electricity, or any outside communication with people not his own family. Israel was a quiet boy that didn't seem to connect with the other children his age when he was living inside of a community. He was nearly friendless and didn't have any similar hobbies or interests of any of his siblings. He also grew up in a family that worshipped a less than favorable religious party. While in Washington, his parents left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and instead became fundamentalist Christians and joined a white supremacist church. They heavily supported the views and pushed these onto their children something that shifted the upbringing of Israel. But they didn't settle down there. In the late 1990s, they again packed up their family and changed locations to Oregon, where they settled into an Amish community. With 10 children and parents who were dealing with their own issues within society, Israel was kind of forgotten, overlooked. He grew up breaking into neighbors' homes to steal belongings of all sorts. He would find guns in dresser drawers and would torture their animals, sometimes to death. He also had an unsettling habit of setting fires near his home and practicing some acts of Satanism, even at his young age. His mischievous childhood quickly transitioned to other scary pastimes, including torturing and shooting animals such as their own family cat. He tied it to a tree before shooting it with a twenty-two revolver. Some also claim that he gutted a deer nearby his home while it was still alive. 
Israel didn't enjoy being in the Amish community. He felt a distant relationship with the other members of his family because of it. His faith wasn't aligned with theirs, and more specifically, he didn't believe in any religion. His Christian family members disagreed heavily with his atheist views, and it caused torment to his father. When he was old enough to, in his late teenage years, Keyes told his family members that he no longer felt the need to share their faith, and he left the community. Leaving meant cutting ties with his father, who he already had a poor relationship with, but he remained on good terms with his mother and most of his siblings. Keyes was ready to explore a different part of life, one where he'd be able to freely express what he wants and chase his hidden desires. When Israel left the Amish community, he joined the army in July of 1998, a new role that he performed very well. He was honorably discharged in July of 2001 and moved to the Maka reservation with his girlfriend and later their daughter. In 2007, Keyes and his family moved to Alaska, where he started his own construction business. He had gained handy skills throughout his youth since living in the forest with his family. However, he would often leave his business and his family behind for unrelated work trips around the country and bordering nations. Until this point in his life, he really didn't have an issue with the law. Keyes was a troublemaker growing up, but he had no legal issues during this time in the army. Aside from one DUI, his record was clean, at least in the eyes of the police. On the evening of February 1, 2012, Samantha Koenig was working at a roadside espresso stand in her small town of Anchorage, Texas. She was expecting to be picked up by her boyfriend and taken home after her shift, as she did most nights. But after multiple unanswered calls and not seeing Samantha leave the shop at closing time, her boyfriend began to wonder where she went. It was unlike her to not pick up her phone, especially when they had plans made. Her boyfriend eventually left the shop and went home assuming that Samantha had changed her plans without updating him. But after multiple hours of no communication, Samantha's boyfriend's phone eventually received a text notification. It was Samantha. But it was a strange text, something that was not expected from her. She was talking about going on vacation because she was tired and even told her boyfriend that she had just left. But her boyfriend knew that this text was not from Samantha, at least not willingly. Something was wrong. And so the next day, when law enforcement was contacted, the investigators looked back on the security camera videos from the store. At around 8 p.m., the video surveillance recordings show Samantha cleaning up the store in her normal closing process. She's alone in the video, and it looks as if she's beginning to pack up all of the things that are currently in the storefront and move those to the back. A masked man walks up to the window. Samantha's posture changes, and for a brief moment in the tape, you can see how she appears to be afraid. Then, Samantha holds up her hands as if there was a weapon being pointed at her. In the video, she's backing away from the window and is clearly in shock. At this point, Samantha backs up and turns the lights off, as if she were told to do so by someone else. You can then see the assailant jump through the storefront window, and it's blurry. But in the next shot, you can see Samantha and the assailant walking away. However, once the lights turn off, it's impossible to see who she is with, or if the suspect is or isn't holding a weapon. After the footage was reviewed, it was clear that Samantha did not leave the store of her own free will. The brief moments that were caught on camera show somebody forcefully entering the store and possibly even kidnapping her. The community had a great wave of fear spread through it, wondering who in such a small area was capable of doing something like this. It didn't take long for the story to hit the media, and other members of the community were worried about their own safety. Not long after the investigation began, the police department joined with the FBI, and they were originally looking at family and friends. The task force wanted to understand everything about Samantha, and also about the hidden parts of her life. But no dark corners rose to the surface. She was a kind person, considerate toward other people, and had a lot of friends that cared so much about her. Samantha's boyfriend was also ruled out as a suspect very quickly, and his concern for her disappearance was true. There were no obvious leads, and the police had no clear route of where to start looking. Ten days after her disappearance, a vigil was held in Texas. Hundreds of people came to hand out flyers, ask around for information within the community, and report anything unusual to the police. All they were looking for was one strong tip that would eventually lead them to the person behind her disappearance. 
Three weeks later, a text came in from Samantha's phone. Connor Park sign under pick of Albert. Ain't she pretty? This text message sounded no more like Samantha than the one about the vacation sounded. All eyes of the task force turned to Connor Park. When the group arrived, there was something pinned up by the local bulletin board. A picture of a missing dog named Albert. And right underneath it was a plastic bag with a photograph and some sort of clipping inside of it. When the police examined the evidence, they noticed that they could see through the transparent bag. There was a typed-out note and a photo of Samantha. It was a ransom note demanding $30,000. The kidnapper wanted it immediately deposited into Samantha's bank account. The photo of Samantha was holding the daily newspaper, proof that she was still alive today. Later that day, Samantha's father deposited $5,000 into her account. Several hours later, that withdrawal was taken using Samantha's ATM card from a nearby bank. Video surveillance of the withdrawal was caught, and it wasn't done by Samantha. The video shows a man covering his face with a mask, wearing dark clothing and gloves. By the time that they arrived at that specific ATM, they had missed the suspect by minutes. One week later, another withdrawal was made again from Samantha's account. But this one was different. It wasn't from the same ATM or even within the same area. This one was from Wilcox, Arizona, nearly 4,000 miles away from the original withdrawal. The withdrawals continued. They followed the trace of the ATM withdrawals and were able to note that the perpetrator was steadily moving east along a single highway. Fortunately, in one of the surveillance videos, they were able to see a white car in the background, specifically a Ford Focus. And even luckier, the image was clear enough that the entire license plate could be determined. Investigators were able to track down this car on the highway and followed until they had a reasonable cause to pull him over. When they observed the vehicle speeding, they stopped it and asked him for identification. The man behind the wheel was Israel Keys. Israel, however, was not a name known to the police because he didn't have a criminal record and he wasn't somebody that they had been looking into as a suspect. They did, though, search his car and cover all ground just in case. In the car were Samantha's ID debit card, cell phone, and a gun. They also found a disguise, including dark clothing and a mask that matched the photos of the man caught at the ATM machine. But Israel was the only person in the car. Where was Samantha? Keyes was taken into custody on the spot. Two weeks after being arrested in Texas, Israel was extradited to Alaska. The police were still unsure of whether he was Samantha's kidnapper or if he had just come across her bank card and was finding these withdrawals out of luck but it didn't take long for Keyes to break under the pressure. Not long after being held, he admitted to the murder of Samantha Koenig. During his confession, Keyes admits to pointing his pistol at Samantha. He claims he chose her at random at night after an impulse to find a victim. After entering the coffee shop and leaving with her, they walked off into the night where Samantha attempted to run away. After catching her, he promised that once the ransom money was delivered, he'd let her walk free. Instead, Keyes drove Samantha back to his family home, where he chained her up inside of his small dark shed. After sexually assaulting her multiple times, he strangled her to death. Within hours of killing her, Keyes and his family left for a Caribbean vacation. When he returned, he took her up to the lake 35 miles north and disposed of her body parts underneath the ice. He also caught a few fish while he was there to take home for dinner. The FBI team was able to recover Samantha's body. The initial investigation had police on their toes, but the darkest parts were yet to come. If Keyes was living a double life, having a family and a child at home, while also kidnapping girls on the side, how long had this act been going on? As it turns out, longer than the police had expected. The FBI began to dig into his background, including his travel records, cell phone records, and even financial statements to find out everything about Keyes that would point to any possible past crimes. He had a long and ambitious history of traveling to different states across the U.S., seemingly without reason. But with little information available to them, the police needed Keyes to agree to have a conversation with them in order to expose what he had done in the past. In other words, they needed a confession. Israel asked for one thing in return. He would tell the FBI all about his past crimes as long as they gave him a date for his execution. Once it was clear that Keyes would be put to death, he began to speak. 
Israel started off by talking about the incident with Samantha. He confessed to the police that typically he was very careful with planning his murders and also meticulous about how he treated his crime scenes. He said that this time he was at odds and he felt out of control. While he normally would have left no evidence behind to be caught, this time he wasn't as smart. Usually he would let his victims come to him, but this time he acted on an impulse. He continued on speaking about some of his victims and also the patterns of his attacks. He claimed that he never planned a victim beforehand and that he had no specific pattern in order to avoid a connection between his crimes. He killed and attacked at random. He was also a meticulous planner beforehand. He planted murder kits around the country where he could safely find and dispose of weapons in the case of future crimes. There were up to 12 of these kits buried across the United States and possibly even other countries, and there may be some still remaining hidden. Keys gave them the names of two victims, a married couple in Vermont. Their names were Bill and Lorraine Courier, and after some investigation, they were in fact missing for some time. They had vanished in June of 2011, leaving their families with no trail to chase. Israel claimed that he flew into Chicago and then drove east. He intentionally planned that trip with a homicide in mind, but he had no victim planned out, aside from knowing that he was planning for a couple. He stayed at a hotel in Essex, Vermont, where he dug up a bucket that he had buried years prior filled with ammunition and firearms. It was clear that Keyes was prepared to kill whenever he felt like it. He had plotted for years and planned ahead, and when the time was right, he took advantage of it. That evening in 2011, he went looking for a house with a couple in it. The courier's garage was open, so it was easy enough for him to wander inside. He made his way into an unlocked door and rushed the victims. He first tied them up and then later took them out to his car and drove them to an abandoned farmhouse that he had already scoped out beforehand and prepared. First, he assaulted Lorraine, and when he noticed that Bill had almost completely untied his restraints and was close to being free, he shot and killed him. Then Israel turned to the wife and strangled her with his bare hands. Not long after their murders, the house was demolished, along with the evidence that likely would have led to the conviction of their murderer. The one item that they found that did link keys to the crime was a fingerprint on an ammunition case found on the scene. His admissions began to grow as he named more and more victims. Keyes began to tell them all about his first attempt at murder, which was roughly in 1997 or 1998. In this instance, he abducted and sexually assaulted a young woman who was between the ages of 14 and 18 in Oregon. He was able to separate her from her group of friends in Maupin, Oregon. And out of fear, she was rambling on and on about random things, and she eventually managed to get into the head of Keyes. Out of remorse, he let her go, but he vowed to never do it again. He said this particular time he didn't feel violent enough, but he knew in the future he would be able to work up to it. Keyes never did find out if this was reported to the police, but he vowed to keep his crime and personal life separate from now on. He would no longer kill or hunt in the city in which he lived. He also vowed to dispose of victims far away from his family life to further separate himself from his crimes. Sometime after this is when he left to join the army. Three years after joining the army, his suspicious behaviors began to increase. Keyes claimed that the town he was living in was too boring for him. His way of finding excitement was to find another victim. He was living in a far northwestern town in Washington called Nia Bay. This is where he met his wife and ended up raising his child. But sometime between 2005 and 2006, Keyes kidnapped someone and brought them onto his boat. But the information and details about this crime never made it past his memory. The investigation into Key's personal life brought up a past that investigators did not see coming. The work of many FBI profilers and police investigators were able to find information about some of Keyes' past surgeries, and in particular, evidence pointed to Keyes having plastic surgery in Mexico, where he was possibly fitted with a gastric band. This type of surgery meant that he wouldn't get hungry as often, meaning he could have gone days in the forest on his own without any resources, possibly to make him a better killer. It's also possible that Keyes could have had his fingerprints changed or removed and had his body hair removed to lessen the chance of leaving any evidence at his crime scenes. The deep dive into his personal life clearly showed that he had a fascination with past serial killers. He had done his research and had followed past murderers to understand how they got away with their crimes and what they did during their murder sprees. 
and investigators, while speaking to his family members, came across some information that helped them find out that he had actually spent time with his mother and siblings in Texas shortly before he was captured by the police. During the visit, his family had noted that something was not quite right with Keyes. They were attempting to have him reconsider his atheism, and they even had a pastor present to speak to him. Keyes confided in them, saying that they had no idea the depths of the darkness that he had gone to, and that they did not know the truth about what he had done. It was clear that Keyes' family had a suspicion that something about him was not normal. But still, no authorities were warned about his strange and unruly behavior before it was too late. Before any more information could be extracted from him, Keyes took his fate into his own hands. Inside his cell, he cut his wrist using a blade from a disposable razor, which he'd embedded into a pencil and snuck inside. It also appeared as if he had attempted to strangle himself with some of the bedding material from his mattress. Inside his cell was discovered to be a blood-soaked suicide note, written with strange, eerie passages like, Crushed like a bug, you still die. Months after his suicide, investigators found a series of 11 skulls sketched underneath the bed of his jail cell. They drew conclusions from there, some of them guessing that the 11 skulls represented 11 victims. That would leave seven unnamed victims of Israel Keys. Police believe that Keyes' actual first victims were two teenage girls between the years of 1996 and 1998, even though he's admitted to authorities that his first murder occurred in 2001. Other killings have supposedly been linked to him without concrete evidence and also without the possibility of a confession. There is one final victim that the police believe belonged to Israel Keyes. Deborah Feldman went missing from New Jersey in 2009, and her body was never recovered. With a lack of forensic evidence, they were unable to verify this link, but the FBI and local police forces claimed that they're confident about the connection. They're also confident that some victims may have remains in other states. His travels also extended all the way up to Montreal in Canada. When he was alive and the police questioned him about killing anyone in Canada, his response was, quote, Canadians don't count. It was clear after the investigation finished that Keyes was looking for a way to tell his story to whoever would listen. It isn't often that the investigators find someone so wrapped up in their own mischief that they are able to get them to talk by promising them a date of death. But in Israel's case, he was so enticed by his own crimes that he was willing to share this information with anyone who would listen. To this day, the question still looms about who Keyes really killed. Random victims at random locations at random times. With no method to his madness, what was the driving force for his gory hobby? According to Keyes himself, this was something that he could control in his life, and it was something that he just simply enjoyed doing. That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. Well, ordinarily it's brief and bingeable. This one is probably double the length of the normal episode that you'll hear. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you are a new listener to 10 Minute Murder, please subscribe wherever you're listening right now. And that does two things. That helps you find the show easier when you want to listen. And it also ensures that you get the new episodes as soon as they come out. You just open the app and then boom, it shows you the newest episode right there immediately. Connect on social media with 10 Minute Murder. If you need help with that, there are links in the show notes of this episode, or just as easily you can go to whatever social media platform you want to follow the show on and type in 10 Minute Murder, the number 10 Minute Murder. If you have friends and you think that they could be into brief stories of true crime, let them know about 10 Minute Murder. And also, ratings and reviews really help this show grow. If you listen in a place that allows that, um, there are several places, Audible, Apple, Spotify being a few of them, Rate and review the show with five stars, and it really helps other people find it. Thank you for listening to 10 Minute Murder. Be safe and make good choices. 